You are listening to Where We Are, a weekend conversation on faith, politics, family, and culture, hosted by me, Michael Ware, and my wife, Melissa. We bring our wide-ranging experiences in politics, ministry, and nonprofit life to bear as we discuss the issues of the day. On this week's episode, we're going to talk about religious bullying in politics and the coercion, the moral coercion of the vote. This is Where We Are. are are This is Where We Are. We are the Wares. I'm Michael, and it's just me this week. We're going to have a a solo episode uh, this weekend. Uh, But there is something I want to talk about. We have had an intense week in the presidential campaign of uh, really, I don't think there's a, a religious bullying. And so I want to talk a bit about how, how faith in presidential campaigns operates, how it ought to operate. Uh, but maybe to set up this conversation, uh, I'll play the two clips that, that prompted this. First, let, let's hear from President uh, Trump's comments on Sebastian Gorka's uh, radio show about Israel and uh, the Jewish vote in America. Why do the Democrats hate Bibi Netanyahu? I actually think they hate Israel. Yes. I don't think they hate him. I think they hate Israel. And the Democrat Party hates Israel. Any Jewish person that votes for Democrats... uh, hates their religion, they hate everything about Israel, and they should be ashamed of themselves because Israel would be destroyed. So there's one clip from uh, the former president of the United States and presumptive nominee of the Republican Party speaking, um, uh, making his case to Jewish voters, let's say. And the second clip I want to play is uh, from Charlie Kirk, who was speaking at a church in California at a uh, ta- uh, Turning Point USA faith event that was held uh, at a church, being interviewed by the pastor uh, at that church. Let's hear what Charlie Kirk has to say when asked if, uh, if Christians can vote for the Democratic Party. So to answer your question, no. If you vote Democrat as a Christian, I think you can you can no longer call yourself a Christian. You have to call yourself something else. I do not think you could be a Christian and vote Democrat. That's the answer. And so uh, there you have it. Um, I, I don't want to spend much time uh, dissecting, critiquing these these two comments, though I, I will say the, the obvious, right? around 70 plus percent of uh, Jewish people in America, Jewish voters in America vote Democratic. Tens of millions of Christians will vote for the Democratic presidential candidate, will vote for Democrats in local races um, this year and have in the past. Uh, And so, you know, pretty audacious uh, a statement is, is one word you could use f- uh, for it from both a former president and and uh, Charlie Kirk but r- right like these these claims are not meant it's it's not productive to debate these claims on their their merits are not really meant to be substantive I think I've said on this podcast before, you know, the, the easiest way to do religious outreach or, or really outreach generally in political campaigns is to say, if you're a real fill in the blank, you'll vote for me. And if you're not a real fill in the blank, then you'll vote for the other candidate. Uh, these are uh, 
you might call identity-based appeals. And, and what they do is they, I mean, they do a number of things, but one thing that they do is seek to bypass reason, bypass tension, and uh, put voters, put individuals in a place where they are either affirming their sense of self, their sense of who they are, their sense of the community in which they uh, uh, you know, consider themselves to belong, or, or rejecting that. Not just in an, in an intellectual way, but sort of in a, in a, in a social way. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of striking at people's sense of, sense of self, but also sense of belonging. And this is the way religious outreach has operated in politics for a very long time. Uh, when, I, uh, when I was asked to uh, lead religious outreach for a presidential campaign, one of the first things I did was I asked six friends who I knew to be associated with the other political party who I thought were probably voting, going to vote for uh, the candidate that, that the campaign I was working for was charged to, to defeat. And I asked them if they'd get on a call with me regularly. And I gave them the authority to sort of hold me accountable on a number of things. One of which was this idea that I never wanted to cross the line in, into suggesting that if, uh, if you were a real Christian, you'd vote for my candidate. If you, were a, if, if you were a good Christian, you'd vote for my candidate. And really, like, it, so, so right in a, in, a, in a secularizing sort of politics, right? Sometimes this is just, if you're a good person, you'll vote for my candidate. Um, this week, to the extent that you see watch campaign appeals, and really just throughout this campaign, from both the Biden campaign and the Trump campaign, See how many direct campaign appeals that you hear from, from either of these campaigns, their surrogates, etc. Essentially boil down to the message, the good people are voting for me and the bad people are voting for, the, for my opponent. That constitutes an insane percentage of what counts as, as outreach. Uh, outreach today. And so look, both these comments from uh, Trump, Kirk, I may be wrong on this. I actually think it's important not to get too f offended by these. It's, it's very clear. It's very transparent what, what these comments are, what they're trying to do. The, the, the fact that neither Kirk nor Trump has any authority, any any real basis for making these kinds of claims. And so I, I don't want to operate in sort of, and I would advise you to not operate in sort of reaction to these kinds of antics. They're not new. At various points, they were more Im implicit. At other points, they were even more explicit, you know, when you think about the racialized politics of, of urban communities where you had, you had sort of a, uh, a, a essentially sort of a racialized or sort of ethnic candidates running in, you know, cities like Chicago. And we still, at the local level, kind of still have candidates like this today. You know, there's a long history of these kinds of, these kinds of tactics. So this is... This is not necessarily new. It's certainly jarring to hear a former president make the kind of statement that, that Trump did. Uh, but these are not new. In, instead, what I want to turn to is, okay, if we're, if we're going to reject this vision of politics that puts all the good people 
voting for candidate A. And by the way, candidate A is always my candidate. <laughs> you know, always, always the candidate that you're supporting. <laughs> you know, and and all the bad people are, are supporting the candidate I, I oppose. <laughs> If we're going to reject that, then what is the basis for our vote? And so that's what we'll talk about after this quick break. You're listening to Where We Are. It has been just two months since my book, The Spirit of Our Politics, was released. And already, I've just had the joy of hearing from so many of you, listeners to where we are, about how the book has helped you and those you love. If you have been waiting for the right time to read The Spirit of Our Politics, this is it. We have a discussion guide available for you at ccpubliclife.org, a free discussion guide. You can also visit ccpubliclife.org and see where I'm traveling around the country discussing this book. I'll even be in the UK uh, next month in April for our UK listeners. Uh, I want to thank you for the support you've given to this book, and I'm looking forward to hearing from more of you in the weeks to come about what you've gained from the spirit of our politics. Thank you for listening to Where We Are. Hey, listeners, I want to tell you about another fantastic podcast that's hosted on the That Sounds Fun Network. I'm a big fan of this one and was actually uh, recently a guest on this podcast. It's the Dadville Podcast. And Dave Barnes and John McLaughlin do such a great job taking us on a journey of life, love, the pursuit of dadding in all of its glory. And so if you're a fan of dad jokes, this show is for you. Dave and John are best known for their individual uh, successful careers as musicians and songwriters. But amidst all of the songwriting and touring, they always return to Dadville. Uh, they have great stories about life and parenting that will have you chuckling, nodding your head, maybe commiserating. Uh, the, the guests that come on share their own stories and life experiences. And this is the kind of show that I think everyone can listen to and enjoy and feel encouraged. If you don't know where to start, you could always try their episode with Ben Rector called Class Clown Adjacent or their episode with Tyler Hubbard called Dragon Ashes. And, of course, we would be remiss not to tell you to uh, uh, tune into the episode I did with Dave and John called Faith, Politics, and Dad Jokes. So check out Dadville. Subscribe, and you'll hear my friends John and Dave every Thursday. Welcome back to where we are. Let's pick up where we left off. If we're not the good people voting for the candidate who is entitled to the votes of people like us, if that's not the framework, how, how, do, we, how do we ground our vote? And I, I, I just say, I, I think a, a few things. One, we understand that we are voting as an act of discernment, as an act, act of stewardship, but a discernment and stewardship that is imperfect for so many reasons, but including the fact that, um, especially when you get to the national level, but even in local elections, it is impossible to factor in all of the kinds of decisions and circumstances in which elected officials, the people you're voting for, are going to find themselves in. When people voted for George W. Bush in 2000, they, th they thought, and George W. Bush thought, that he was running to revamp conservative domestic policy. He thought that would be his legacy. So in his first year, in his opening months, he passes No Child Left Behind, a sort of conservative but bipartisan education reform. He creates... Uh, an Office of Faith-Based uh, and Community Initiatives, which he suggests is going to 
unleash armies of compassion in America. Uh, that that uh, there, uh, there's going to be a conservative policy approach that meets people in need with, with real help. These were the terms of the 2000 election. They spent you know, so much of the election talking about you know, Al Gore's lockbox and the future of entitlement programs and all these things. And then, of course, what happens? 9-11 happens, and the election that took place in 2000 that was a, a peacetime election in which the winner of that election was a governor with no real foreign policy experience is a wartime president for the majority of his his presidency the vast majority of his presidency there is no way voters could have anticipated that now of course you could say voters uh should have considered foreign policy, national security, more in their votes. But a, you know, we can have a, we can have a long debate about whether that should should have or would have changed the outcome. But the 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 point is, is that voters are making decisions based on both imperfect assessment, but an imperfect assessment of totally inherently in incomplete an incomplete set of facts and knowledge about not just the the future but of the of of the present of what what actually the real state of things uh, uh, are you only have so much access to understand what a candidate uh, would do in elected office and so we just have great humility when we think about voting, when we think about our vote, when we think about the votes that other people are making, we understand that voting is not a pure, unmediated expression of one's will, that people can make mistakes with their vote, they could be wrong about their vote as a, as a, as a subjective judgment without their vote being a sin. I, I think the other thing that that we that we do with our vote. So we have a humility about our vote. We we have a recognition of the the imperfections of of the vote as an expression of one's one's will or even one's policy perspective. We we also I think recognize that we each bring a set of experiences and priorities and perspective that limit and focuses you know our priorities and that's a that's a natural it's a natural thing one's own perspective one's own experiences one's own interests are naturally and i think sensibly going to influence how one votes and i think we could try to ignore that or or sort of not talk about that i, I actually think it's important to 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 acknowledge it and and to a certain extent just accept like I, I we each just have one vote that that's that's all we have and there is an aspect of our democracy that is about sort of personal sort of representation so you know it, the example i you know if if you are in a season of life where you're thinking about where you're heading into retirement you're going to think about medicare you're going to think about social security. You're going to think about, right, like a whole range of issues related to your season of life. If you have family, you know, if you, if you have, you might be in that season of life, but then you'll think about maybe what season of life you're, if you have children, what season of life your, your children are in. Do you have family members that have particular challenges or work in a particular field that public policy influences? And so, like, we're, we're voting on in a way that's influenced by the experiences that are most accessible to us. And to a certain extent, that is okay. And, and just the last thing I'd say is that we, we also want sort of our personal experiences, priorities, 
passions, to be both informed and tempered by to the best of our ability an assessment of the needs of those around us who 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 may not, you know who, who who aren't family members that that don't count as you know self interest but we understand that we're you know voting is a sort of act of self governance not just for ourselves and our households but for the community in which we are a part and so we take responsibility not just for our own needs with our vote but we try to consider the needs of others now, you'll be most able to do this if you're in community with and paying attention to what others are saying, particularly those that are in a different socioeconomic sort of location than you are. Now, this approach to voting is a lot messier than an approach to voting that just says, well, if you're a real Christian, if you're a real Jew, if you're a real Italian, if you're a real this, if you're real that, uh, you'll 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 vote for candidate A. The 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 upside is that it puts you in a position where you aren't condemning your neighbors, puts you in a position where you aren't ultimatizing your vote and your perspective and your political judgment, and that's important not just for like social cohesion. For, for uh, n- not making judgments around those around you. It's important because we learn. I mean, just, just like we, we, we will uh, come up against the fallibility of our political judgments. We will come up against the error of our political judgments. And when we do, I think we at least want to be able to look back and say, gosh, I wish I had gotten that right. I wish I had voted a different way. I wish I had had a different position on this issue. But I am, I am grateful that I didn't condemn those who disagreed with me. I am grateful that I didn't claim an authority that I do not have. And so that's the, that's the message I wanted to share in today's episode. I, I, I know a lot of you have seen these remarks from Trump, from Kirk. Maybe you've seen other candidates on, on either side of the aisle sort of make these kinds of statements it 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 is what our politics is made of what i would recommend and and what i'd love to see particularly for the church is that we would be the kind of people we would be the kind of church that does not subjugate ourselves and our community to the easy and convenient coercions of our politics all right friends that's that's all i have for you for this episode of where we are look forward to being back next week hopefully with melissa you've been listening to where we are